If you'll stand with me and turn in your Bibles to John 15, verse 12 through 17. And I'm going to ask that at least uh, the first part, if you keep your Bible open, I'm going to mention some things before I actually get into the slides. John 15, starting with the 12th verse. Remember, we're still in that upper room discourse. This is when Jesus says his parting words to his disciples. I think we're picking up basically right where we left off last Sunday, as far as scripture, or very close to it. It says this in verse 12, and I'm in the NIV. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Look at the 12th and the 17th verse with me before we start. In this passage, um, there's no way I can preach this from start to finish and cover everything that's on my heart to say. There's so much in these short, this short little passage. But I do want you to notice the bookends. The 12th verse, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And then verse 17, the last one, this is my command, love each other. So everything I'm going to talk about is in between those, that's, let's remember what the bookends are, right? Love each other. Love each other as I've loved you. All right, so keep that in mind as we talk about being a friend of of God. It strikes me as I read this passage that God, Jesus said, I call you friend. I don't know at first glance if we can even fathom what that means that God would call us friend. I no longer call you servants. Instead, I have called you friends. Now, that word in Greek is doulos. It means slave. Most modern translations don't like to put the word slave. It just sounds a little too harsh, so they call it servant. It's okay. It works. And Philos is the Greek word for friend. So a servant and a friend. A servant and a friend. Think about that. When Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, instead I have called you friends, he's not saying we're not servants. He's just saying, I'm calling you a friend, and I see you as a friend. Let's look at this. Jesus is master and Lord, and, and, and we are his servants. All right? The statement doesn't say that we're not. He is, of course he is, master. A master tells the slave or the servant what to do. He is Lord. He's the one that owns the estate. He's the Lord of the the manor, so to speak. He's the one that's running the show. He is Lord God Almighty. Jesus is the one we serve. This Greek word doulos, when you look at Strong's, uh, the, the... Definition is a slave, a bondman, a man of servile condition. De- listen to this, this. This is the part I really jumped out at me. Devoted to another, devoted to another, to the disregard of one's own interests. Jesus 
doulos. My own interests take a backseat to his interests, his will. He's the, he is the Lord, he is the master. And therefore, my life is committed to serving him. This doesn't go over real well in our society today. A lot of people don't want to be told that they need to have the heart of a servant, that they need to serve someone else. In fact, well, let's just say this. When you look at the scripture, it usually is the opposite of what the world thinks. <laughs> and this is one of them, isn't it? They think that many would say, well, being a bond slave or being a, a, a bond slave is someone who's sold themselves into slavery on purpose. If that's beneath, they think that's beneath me. I'm my own man. I'm my own woman. I will do what I want to do. But to give myself into the, what's the interests of another, no, no, that's beneath me. I'm not a slave. I will not do that. I won't do it. I'm absolutely convinced that the, the criticism that comes against God's word today and against this church is because people don't like the light that it shines on their evil deeds. The Bible makes that very clear. They don't like it because, guess what? Then I don't get to do what I want to do. I want to do what I want to do. And you tell me I need to do, do what Jesus wants me to do? No, no. That's beneath me. I'm not going to do that. Well, consider this. As you look at the epistles that were written by the various apostles, they start off with this. Paul, a servant, that's doulos, of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Mike, I need the next slide. Paul, Paul calls himself a doulos. That word servant there in Greek, doulos, slave, bondsman, one who puts the interest of another ahead of their own. James, do you know who James is? James is the half-brother of Jesus. He said, I'm a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, James, oh, let's throw Peter in there. Simon Peter in 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Jude, in Jude 1, a servant of Jesus Christ. That's how apostles saw themselves. We are servants of Jesus Christ. And why is it that they saw themselves as a servant of Jesus Christ? Well, because they're just following the example of their Lord. If it's beneath you to be his servant, I can tell you it wasn't beneath Paul. It wasn't beneath James. It wasn't beneath Peter. It wasn't beneath Jude. It wasn't beneath the many who gave their lives for him. And it wasn't beneath Jesus. God Almighty. Think of it. He made himself, in Philippians 2, verse 7 and 8, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, doulos, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You can see this is the example that God Almighty set, the heart of a servant. You cannot be a Christian if you don't have the heart of a servant. Pastor, that's a pretty bold statement. Well, the truth can be bold sometimes. Jesus said, I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Do the things, I missed a word in it, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. John 8, 28 and 29. I always do the things that are pleasing to him. That's how Jesus lived his life. And then it says in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom 
for many. Question. Do I have a heart of a servant? Be honest. You know, we're fine with being a servant of the Lord. We'll, we'll say that. Yeah, you're my Lord. You're my Lord and Savior. You're my master. I'm a servant of the Lord. It's easy to say. It's not hard to say at all. And it's easy to serve him until he tells you to do something your flesh doesn't want to do. Yeah, we're, we're fine with being a servant of the Lord if we aren't told to do something we don't want to. Oh, yeah, I obey my mom and dad. Always do. Until they tell me to do something I don't want to do. <laughs> Come on. I, I, here's a question for you. Go for it. You ready? When's the last time the Holy Spirit told you to do something that your first reaction was, oh, but I don't want to do it? Or is it everything that God tells you to do, you've got yourself convinced that it's just stuff you want to do anyway? I was speaking to someone some time ago, and they made this comment about another person that we both know. And they made this comment. It's always interesting. The Lord always tells this other person exact to do what that person exactly wants to do anyway. An observation. God told me to... Well, that's what you want to do. But the Holy Spirit, as he guides us and directs us, and we're his servant, we're the servant of the Lord, tells us to do things that make us wade in a little bit deeper. And if I've been ankle deep for the last 20 years... There is something wrong. And I am not here to, to make you feel bad. I'm here to set you free. Fear is holding you back from obeying God. A, you, your lack of trust in the Lord is very evident. You won't go more than ankle deep. Because the minute me as his servant, when he says, hey, I want you to go clean out the barn. Well, I don't like mucking the barn with all the manure and stuff. I don't want to do that. Rake all that up. Well, someone's got to do it. I remember one Sunday I preached. I can't remember now. But there, is there any job beneath us? Oh, I remember what it was. It was the one when Jesus washed their feet, right? Which is like the lowest job you could do. And Jesus, God Almighty, did it. And then he said this. He said, as I have done to you, now you do that to each other. Servant. Do I have a heart of a servant or is it just blah, 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 blah? And the first time I have to sacrifice a little bit, the first time I have to actually do something I really don't want to do. Listen, are you listening to me? Listen, the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you in the, sometime in the near future. And he is going to tell you to do something. Your first reaction is, I don't want to do it. Here's what I want you to do. Hallelujah, Lord! I got a chance to serve you and to show that it's not just all about me. Oh, you want me to do that, but I don't want it. But you know what? I do want to do it, because that's my way of saying, I'm your servant. Okay, I'll do it. I could stand here right now and list off at least five things on my list of to-dos that I don't want to do. In my flesh. They're not comfortable. They're not easy. But you know what? 
eyes with it, and I go to the Lord in prayer and say, thank you for the opportunity to serve you. To, to, to really make a point, I'm the servant, you're the Lord, you're the master. Did you get it? Are you getting it? Serve the Lord. It's not just a phrase. It's what you do every day. What do you want me to do with my time? Several Wednesday nights, I talked about how we were to, to redeem the time for the days are evil. What do you do all day? What do you do? What's the Lord have you do? The next word. We've talked about doulos, the slave, the servant. Now let's talk about friend. Go up on more. Oh, that one right there, yes. You're my friends if you do what I command, Jesus said. So Jesus is the master and Lord, and we are his servants. And he calls us friend. As I thought about this, what's going on in Ukraine came to my, my mind. And I used to teach American history, so I know a little bit about it. And I know, for example, during World War II, Stalin used his troops as basically cannon fodder. They would just charge into a hopeless situation where they were going to die. And if they turned around and ran, or, or would, then, then the, the Russian officers behind them would shoot them. So you're going to get shot if you go against the Germans, because the Russians were fighting the Germans. You're going to get shot if you go against them. You're going to die. And, or if you go the other way, you're going to get shot too. Now, why do I say that? I see what's going on in Ukraine. I go, well, some things just don't change. Just throw those young boys in there, those conscripts. Just throw them at it. Thousands killed. What's the point? As a master and a lord, or the dictator of a country, the one in charge tells the servants what to do tells the people, you're going to do this. But he doesn't call them friends. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. Just throw them in. In this, in this country, in our, our sordid history of slavery in this country, the master of the plantation could treat his slaves as just property and not care. You know what I care about? I care about that the work gets done. Go do it. And the minute you're not useful to me, I can sell you or get, and I, I, you know, no concern. But we also know that there were situations where the master would call them friends. And they became friends. Indeed, I would suggest that, of course, I can speak from now from in, in, in our, our age and the way we see things, that if you really want to call them friends, you need to set them free <laughs> if you cared about them. But let's not go there. Here's my point. Jesus said, I don't just call you my servant and just make you do, but I call you. It's amazing. The what, what is this word friend in Greek? It's the word philos. To be friendly to one, wish him well, 
he who associates familiarly with one, a companion. A compa think of that when you think of God calling you a friend. Think of it. But the definition I like best comes from Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, and it says this. One, a friend. Uh, before I read this, let me say this to you. I love the 1828 Dictionary of the American Language because it was written back when this country still had a Christian worldview. And so you see a lot of Christianity in the way we defined our words. Just thought I'd throw that in there. And you can still buy this dictionary, by the way. Noah Webster called, said, a friend is one who is attached to another by affection. Now, do you remember what we talked about last week? The vine and the branch? Right? Attached by affection. One who entertains for another sentiments of esteem, respect, and affection, which lead him to desire his company and seek to promote his happiness and prosperity. He calls you friend. What a privilege to be the friend of God. Now, I realize that in some churches, when they talk about being a friend of God, unfortunately, they don't preach the first part of my sermon today, which is, by the way, you're still the servant, too. They just think of God as, well, here's my, here's my buddy. Here's my friend. Right? He may be our friend, but we are not equals. He is God, and we are not. He is master and Lord, and we are still a servant. It's just that the master and Lord sees us something more than a servant. He says, yes, and you're my friend as well. And those very things you see up there on that screen, that's what God wants for us. And is it not what we want for him? Because being a friend is reciprocal, isn't it? It's mutual. Do you, are you attached to him? Is he your friend? Are you affectionate, esteem him, respect him, desire his company? And do you want to promote God's happiness and prosperity? Well, we don't really need to do that. But we'll, we'll use these terms. I want to please him. The Bible says we're to please God. And that's the kind of servant and friend I want to be, is the one who pleases him. I did a quick search on Google. I'll make this quick. <laughs> um, it talked about friendship. Real friends stick together during hard times. Real friends forgive and see the best in their friend. Real friends are honest and real with each other. Real friends nurture their friendship because it brings joy and they highly value it. Now that's from a secular point of view. This is a secular website. And that's what the world would define as friend. That's not wrong, is it? So if you think about that and God, does God stick with us during hard times? Hey, do you stick with God during your hard times? Friends. Does God forgive us? Does he see the best in us? Does he know what we can be? He takes us just as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us there, right? He sees the best in us. He sees what we can be. And as we trip and fall along the way, hey, he pill, picks us up and says, let's keep going. It's called perseverance. Are you honest and real with God? I can promise you he's honest and real with you when you read the scripture. And do you nurture your friendship with him? Do you highly value it? Does it bring you joy? I'll tell you what, his friendship with you brings him joy. Did you know you can bring joy to the heart of God? Think of it. Not that God needs you. Not in the way men need other men. Or, but he's God. But it does bring joy to him when we serve him, when we love him. And we value our friendship with God. Do you know there are only two people in all of the Old Testament that God called friend? Can you think of any? Can you think of who they were? Abraham, and Moses. 
It says in James 2, 23, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. Wow, what Abraham. In Exodus 33, 11, it says the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Those are the only two people in all of all the Old Testament, think of it, that God called friend. Now, that doesn't mean that he didn't see others as, as his, his, his prophets and so forth, but those are the only two he called friend. As his friend, he confides in us. That's what friends do. In this passage we've read in John here, it says, everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. He's not just barking out orders, but he's actually... He's, 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 he's saying, this is my heart. This is what I want. This is, I, want you to get the, I want you to have the same mind as I have, the mind of Christ. I want you to have the same heart and compassion and caring that I have. He's teaching us. He's revealing things to us. Consider the incredible honor it is to have God call you friend. I don't know about you, but I don't find that a burden. That lifts my soul. God is for you, not against you. God is your friend. He's there to help you. Praise his name. I'm going to stop, Mike. Can you just take, his, take me to the very last slide? I'll preach the rest of this next Sunday or Wednesday. But I want us to end with this. The paradox of spiritual truth. I said it earlier. Oftentimes what the scriptures teach us about the heart of God is almost always exact opposite of the way the world sees things. Think of it this way. We become a servant to know freedom. And perhaps I'll talk about that in detail next week. Remember it says, Jesus said, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed, right? What does that mean to know the freedom? We don't know freedom, real freedom, real freedom, until we're a servant. That's the paradox, the spiritual truth. It's like, whoa. How do you, no, you're not free, you're, you're a slave. Yeah, well, to be his slave is to be a king. <laughs> to be his slave is the most privileged place you can be because you're not just his slave, you're also his friend. And we become a servant to become a friend. Well, that's odd. I thought it was just somebody hired and making $12 an hour to sit here and crank this stuff out and that the people don't, don't even care. Well, that's the way it is in the world oftentimes, but that's not his way. He cares. He calls you friend. He calls me friend.